Hello everybody, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, we're starting a new playlist, MCAT Behavioral Science. Now, this playlist is based on the Kaplan book, and today we're going to start with chapter one, which is titled Biology and Behavior. Now, the objectives that we're going to cover in this chapter are the following. First, we're going to discuss the history of neuropsychology and we're going to talk about a couple of important individuals who really formed the foundation of current knowledge about neuroanatomy. Then we're going to move into learning about the organization of the human nervous system. We're going to talk about the central and peripheral nervous system and we're going to learn that the peripheral nervous system can be divided into two branches, the somatic and the autonomic and we're going to discuss both. Then we're going to move into the organization of the brain. In this section, we're going to identify various anatomical structures inside the human brain. And we're going to talk about how the, the, the brain is divided into three categories. We have the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain, and we'll cover generally what each of these divisions consist of. And in the fourth objective, we're going to focus on the forebrain. The forebrain forms the largest portion of the brain by weight and volume, and we're going to work through the different regions and functions of the forebrain together. Fifth, we're going to move into a discussion on the influences on behavior. So merely describing the functions of the brain regions does not fully explain the wide variety of human behaviors that are possible. Other influences like chemical controls, hereditary, and the environment are all going to influence human behavior as well. And so we're going to go over these influences together in the fifth objective. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about development. The development process begins at the moment of conception and changes occur quickly. So we're going to discuss and begin to understand these changes and when they occur. With that being said, the link between mind and body is definitely a hot topic in medicine. This playlist is going to be extremely applicable to you future doctors and I hope you enjoy it. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with our first objective which is all about a brief history of neuropsychology. Now during the 19th century, the study of behavior underwent a significant transformation. It shifted from a philosophical perspective to a more empirical and scientific one. And this era marked the genesis of our contemporary understanding of neuroanatomy and then its conne connection to cognition and behavior. So in other words, researchers in the 19th century, they began to think about behavior from a physiological perspective. And many of these early thinkers formed the foundation of current knowledge about neuroanatomy. And this is where we're linking the functions of specific areas of the brain with thought and behavior. And we're going to start by talking about a man named Franz Gall. He lived between 1758 to 1828, and he was one of the earliest um, people who developed a theories that behavior, intellect, and even personality might be linked to brain anatomy. And he specifically developed the doctrines of phrenology. All right, the basic idea of phrenology was that if a particular trait was well developed, then the part of the brain that's responsible for that trait would expand. This expansion, according to Gall, would push the area of the skull that covered that part of the brain outward and therefore cause a bulge on the head. And then Gall believed that one could then measure um, psychological attributes by feeling or measuring the skull. Of course, his work was debunked, but Gall's ideas did spur some research into brain functions. With that being said, the next person that we want to talk about is Pierre Florence. He was the first person to study the functions of the major sections of the brain. And he did this by extirpation on rabbits and, and pigeons. So in extirpation, various parts of the brain 
are surgically removed, and then the behavioral consequences. Are observed, and what Florin's work showed, and what it led to was his assertion that the brain had specific parts for specific functions, and the removal of any part, any one part, weakens the whole brain. Now, after Pierre Florin's, we want to talk about William James, who's known as the father of American psychology, and he believed that it was important to study how the mind functioned in adapting to the environment. And his view was among the first theories that formed a branch of psychology known as functionalism. This is a system of thought in psychology that studied how mental processes help individuals adapt to their environment. John Dewey is another important name in functionalism because his 1896 article is seen as its inception. So this article criticized the concept of the reflex arc, which breaks the process of reacting to a stimulus into discrete parts. Dewey believed that psychology should focus on the study of the organism as a whole as it functioned to adapt to the environment. Now, around 1860, Paul Broca comes into the scene. He added to the knowledge of physiology by examining the behavioral deficits of people who have brain damage. He was the first person to demonstrate that specific functional impairments could be linked with specific brain lesions. And Broca found that a man who had been unable to talk was unable to do so because of a lesion in a specific area on the left side of the brain. And this area of the brain is now referred to as Broca's area. Another important individual is Hermann von Helmholtz. He was the first to measure the speed of a nerve impulse. And by actually measuring the speed of a nerve, nerve impulse in terms of reaction time, Helmholtz is often credited with the transition of psychology into a field of the natural sciences. Now, just as a little bit of a, a side note, if you want to go over nerve impulses and uh, any information on that, we discuss these topics in MCAT biology. I believe you will learn more about the nervous system, nerve impulses in chapter four specifically. And I just wanted to get, let you guys know in case you're thinking about nerves and nerve impulses now and you're like, got to touch up on that. So that's where you can find that information. Now, around the turn of the century, Sir Charles Sherrington first inferred the existence of synapses. So many of his conclusions actually have held over time, except for one. He thought that synaptic transmission was an electrical process, but we now know that it's primarily a chemical one. And again, if you're interested in going over synapses, also it's in chapter four in the MCAT biology playlist. Now, with that, all right, We've been introduced to a couple of in individuals, a couple of scientists here, and these pioneers' contributions were very critical in shaping modern neuroscience. However, it is important to acknowledge that there are some ethical considerations regarding their methods, particularly in animal research and studies involving patients with brain damage. Regardless, a lot of this work definitely pioneered some of the current work that's that's being done in neuroscience and future directions in neuroscience they continue to evolve with di with with technologies like functional mri which has really helped scientists learn about the brain and unravel the brain's mysteries and as we build upon the legacies of these 19th century scientists our understanding of the brain and behavior continues to grow now, with that introduction and with that brief history of neuropsychology, let's move into our second objective, which is on the organization of the human nervous system. Now, the human nervous system is a complex web of over 100 billion cells that communicate, coordinate, and regulate signals for the rest of the body. And mental and physical action occurs when the body can react to external stimuli 
using the nervous system. So the goal of this objective then is to look at the nervous system and its basic organization. To start, we want to say that there are three kinds of nerve cells in the nervous system. You have sensory neurons, also known as afferent neurons. They transmit sensory information from receptors to the spinal cord and brain. Then we also have motor neurons, also known as efferent neurons. They transmit motor information from the brain and spinal cord to muscles and glands. And then the third type of neuron we have are interneurons. These are found between other neurons, and they're the most numerous of the three types of neurons. Interneurons are located predominantly in the brain and spinal cord and they're often linked to reflexive behavior and neural circuits called reflexive arcs control this type of behavior so for example let's pretend you're walking and you accidentally step on a lego all right receptors in the foot detect the pain and the pain signal is going to be transmitted by sensory neurons up to the spinal cord at that point, the sensory neurons connect with interneurons, which can then relay pain impulses up to the brain. But rather than waiting for the brain to send out a signal, interneurons in the spinal cord are going to send signals to the muscles of both your legs. All right? They send signals to both of your legs. The one that stepped on the Lego, the signal is for you to lift that foot up so you are no longer incurring pain from stepping on that Lego and signal to your other leg to keep you supported and standing, all right? And so, rather than waiting for the brain to send out a signal, you have these interneurons in the spinal cord send signals to the muscles of both your leg directly, and it's going to cause you to withdraw the foot with pain and support the other foot. And the original sensory information, though, it still makes its way up to the brain. However, by the time it arrives there, thankfully, the muscles have already responded to the brain thanks to the reflexive arc. So that's a little bit of a motivation about the nervous system and our nerve cells. So now let's turn to the overall structure of the human nervous system, which is diagrammed here. Now, the nervous system can be broadly divided into two primary components. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system is made up of nerve tissue and fibers outside of the brain and spinal cord. This is going to include all 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 10 out of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Now, the peripheral nervous system connects the central nervous system to the rest of the body, and it itself can be subdivided into the somatic and autonomic nervous system. What is the difference between these two? Well, the, som the, the somatic nervous system, it consists of sensory and motor neurons that are distributed through the skin, joints, and muscles. All right. The autonomic nervous system, it generally regulates heartbeat, respiration, digestion, and glandular secretions. In other words, the autonomic nervous system manages the involuntary muscles that are associated with many of those internal organs and glands, and it also helps regulate body temperature. The main thing to understand about these functions is that they are automatic or they're independent of conscious control. And you can note the similarity in the words so that it's easier to remember. Autonomic nervous system is automatic. All right, so that's one way to keep in mind. Now, the autonomic nervous system itself has two subdivisions, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And these two branches often act in opposition to one another. One another meaning that they're antagonistic. So for example, the sympathetic nervous system 
acts to accelerate heart rate and inhibit digestion, while the parasympathetic nervous system decelerates heart rate and increases digestion. Now, the main role, if we were to focus first, let's talk about this parasympathetic nervous system. The main role of the parasympathetic nervous system is to conserve energy. To conserve energy. It is associated with resting and sleeping states and it acts to reduce heart rate and constrict the bronchi. The parasympathetic nervous system also responsible for managing digestion and it does this by increasing peristalsis and exocrine secretions. Now on the other hand we could talk about the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is activated by stress and it can include everything from a mild stressor to emergencies. The sympathetic nervous system is closely associated with rage and fear reactions, also known as fight or flight. All right, so sympathetic nervous system, you can remember as flight or fight. And on the other hand, you can remember parasympathetic as rest and digest. So that's one way to help you remember what does what here. Regardless, the sympathetic nervous system, when activated, can increase heart rate, redistribute blood to muscles, increase blood glucose concentration, relax the bronchi, decrease digestion, and dilate the eyes to maximize, maximize light intake. And all of those are kind of summarized in this infograph right here. So we have the parasympathetic nervous system. What happens to the pupil? It constricts. What happens to the heart rate? It slows down. What happens to the airways? Well, the parasympathetic nervous system constricts the bronchi. And the liver? Oh, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates bile release. It constricts blood vessels. It stimulates the digestive uh, system etc. On the other hand, we have the sympathetic nervous system. What happens to the pupil? Dilates and heart rate is increased. Airway? Well, here you're going to have dilation of the bronchi. Sweat glands, they're going to be stimulated, stimulates secretion. Liver is going to increase the rate of glycogen to glucose. The digestive system is going to decrease activity. So with that being said, We've talked about what we need to for the organization of the nervous system. The next thing we want to talk about is the organization of the brain. The organization of the brain. And here, what we want to talk about is the three main divisions that we can um, define for the brain. And different parts of the brain are going to perform remarkably different functions. So for example, one part of the brain processes sensory information, while an entirely different part of the brain maintains activities of the internal organs. Now, for complex functions, several brain regions are going to work together. And those are kind of the things that we're going to see as we talk about the organization of the brain here in the third objective, and also when we focus on the for, uh, forebrain in the fourth objective. So let's start with a couple of notes. The first note is that the brain has three subdivisions. That's the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And also the brain, I'm going to scroll down from these notes, now show you this image of the brain with a lot of the regions labeled here. We're going to be covering over these different regions of the brain and their functions. But even before we get to any of that, it's important for us to talk about what the brain is covered with. The brain is covered with a thick sheath of connective tissue called the meninges. All right, the meninges help protect the brain, keep it anchored within the skull, and resorb uh, cerebrospinal fluid. It's composed of three layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Now, cerebrospinal fluid is the aqueous solution in which the brain and spinal cord rest, and it is produced by specialized cells that line the ventricles of the brain. 
Now what I want to do is I want to scroll back up to where we saw these notes on the three subdivisions of the brain, right? The human brain can be divided into three basic subdivisions, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. Now, something that's really interesting is that in terms of physical location and functionality, there's a significant correlation. And what I mean by that is you'll notice that as we talk about brain structures, we're going to see that brain structures associated with basic survival are going to be located at the base of the brain and brain structures with more complex functions are located higher up. And the meaningful connection between brain location and functional complexity is no accident. So in evolutionary terms, the hindbrain and the midbrain were brain structures that developed earlier. Together, they form the brain stem, which is the most primitive region of the brain. The forebrain developed later including the limbic system, is a group of neural structures primarily associated with emotion and memory. Things like aggression, fear, pleasure, and pain are all related to the limbic system. Now, the most recent evolutionary development of the human brain is the cerebral cortex, which is the outer covering of the cerebral hemispheres. In humans, the cerebral cortex is associated with everything from language processing to problem solving and from impulse control to even long-term planning. Now, we're going to talk about each of these subdivisions in details, but an obvious question to ask is how do these different parts of the brain develop? Well, in prenatal life, the brain develops from neural tube at first, the tube is composed of three swellings, which correspond to the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. Now, both the, the hindbrain and the forebrain later divide into two swellings, creating five total swellings in the mature neural tube. All right, and the embryonic brain is diagrammed right here, as you see in the subdivisions are shown as well, and it is what we're going to talk about in detail next. The first thing we're going to start off with is talking about the hindbrain. It is located where the brain meets the spinal cord and it's also referred to as the rhombin cephalon. It controls balance, motor coordination, breathing, digestion, and general arousal processes such as sleeping and waking. So in short, the hindbrain manages vital functioning necessary for survival. During embryonic development, the rhombencephalon is going to divide to form the myelencephalon and the metencephalon. The myelencephalon becomes the medulla oblongata and the metencephalon becomes the pons and the cerebellum. Now, the medulla oblongata is a lower brain structure that is responsible for regulating vital functions such as breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. And again, that is associated with the myelencephalon. So we're going to go ahead and write that. Medulla oblongata. Now the metencephalon, like we said, all right, becomes the pons and the cerebellum. Pons and cerebellum. The pons lies above the medulla and it contains sensory and motor pathways between the cortex and the medulla. Now, at the top of the hindbrain, mushrooming out of the back of the pons is the cerebellum. And this is a structure that helps maintain posture and balance and coordinates body movements. If you were to damage your cerebellum, this would cause clumsiness, it would cause slurred speech, and it would result in a loss of balance. So that is the hindbrain for us. Let's scroll back up here where we write our takeaway notes. It contains the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, and the pons. And what is the function? It, it functions to help motor movements, vital functioning like breathing and digestion, arousal, and alertness. With that, we can move into discussing the midbrain. 
Now, just above the hindbrain is the midbrain, also referred to as mesencephalon. It receives sensory and motor information from the rest of the body, and it is associated with involuntary reflux responses that are triggered by visual or auditory stimuli. Now, there are several prominent nuclei in the midbrain, two of which are collectively called the colliculi. The superior colliculus is going to receive visual sensory input, and the inferior colliculus is going to receive sensory information from the auditory system. So let's write that down. The midbrain, also referred to as the mesencephalon, all right, it has several prominent nuclei. There's several prominent nuclei in the midbrain, and it's called colliculi. All right, and you have superior and inferior. Fantastic. Now we can move into talking about the forebrain. Now this is going to be very just preliminary information about the forebrain because the fourth objective is completely dedicated to talking about the forebrain in depth. But above the midbrain is the forebrain, also referred to as the prosencephalon. It's associated with complex perceptual, cognitive, and behavioral processes. Now, among its other functions, the forebrain is associated with emotion and memory. And it is the forebrain that has the greatest influence on human behavior. It functions, its functions are not absolutely necessary for survival, but they're associated with intellectual and emotional capacities that are descriptive and characteristic of human beings. Now, during prenatal development, the prosencephalon divides to form the telencephalon. The telencephalon is going to form the cerebral cortex. It's going to form the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia. Oh, my pen is failing me right now. And in addition to that, the limbic system. It will also form the diencephalon. The diencephalon forms the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the posterior pituitary gland, and the penal gland. So let's go ahead and write that down. Thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland or posterior pituitary gland, and the penal gland. So there we have it. Now before we move into the fourth objective where we talk some more about the forebrain, we want to go ahead and talk about something that's important to recognize, and that's the methods of mapping the brain. One traditional method involves studying patients with brain lesions. However, the challenge here is that lesions often affect multiple brain areas, and that makes it difficult to pinpoint which area is responsible for a specific functional impairment. Now, to overcome this, researchers study brain lesions in laboratory animals. And so in these controlled settings, precise lesions can be created. And then you can study what that lesion causes in terms of consequences and then associate specific brain regions with specific functions. Now, something else that's really interesting is that electrical stimulation and recording of brain activity is another method to study the brain. In humans, this involves stimulating the brain cortex with a small electrode. This is going to cause neurons to fire and activate specific behaviors or perceptions, and this technique helps neurosurgeons create cortical maps. And it can actually be used on awake patients since the brain itself doesn't have any pain receptors, of course, with some local anesthesia. It can also be done on lab animals. Electroids have also been used in lab animals to study deeper regions of the brain. And of course, depending on where they're implanted, the electroids can elicit a range of actions. It can elicit sleep or sexual arousal, rage or terror, and stimulation of different brain regions can be Upon that, researchers can study 
the actions that happen as a consequence of that. Fantastic. Now, electrodes can also be used to record electrical activity produced by the brain itself. So in some studies, individual neurons are recorded by inserting ultra-sensitive microelectrodes into individual brain cells and then recording their electrical activity. Electrical activity generated by a larger group of neurons can be studied using an EEG, which involves placing several electrodes on the skull, uh, on the scalp, I should say, my apologies. And broad patterns of electrical activity can thus be detected and recorded. And this procedure is non invasive, so it doesn't cause any damage. And it can be commonly used with human subjects. In fact, research on sleep, seizures, and brain lesions relies heavily on these EEGs. With that, we have completed our third objective. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here. In the next part, we're, we're going to continue with our fourth objective, which is on parts of the forebrain. And I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.